Christianity right there. God takes you from the junk, from among the world, and he begins a process of making you look like his desired image. And what is the image that God is calling us to look like? Jesus. And even Jesus had to go through, as a man, even Jesus had to be perfected. Not his God nature, his man nature. Because Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. So he dealt with everything that we are going through and even more. So keep that in mind as you serve God. This is why Jesus says, count the cost. He said, no one begins to build a house and then realize that they don't have enough to finish it. People, this is what people should expect as if they are coming into a relationship with God. If they don't expect this, when the persecution comes, when the resistance comes, when the fire comes, when the adversity comes, when the temptation comes, either they're going to result to a false teaching and believe something that God didn't say that makes them feel justified in their hearts, or they're going to abandon the faith. But in the fire, in that process of being made new, who was constantly at work? The maker, the Holy Spirit, constantly at work. Does God leave you in the midst of the work, in the midst of the process? No, he's the one doing it. And he has many different methods that he uses. I think we talked about it last week. God will use what it is in this week. Yeah, last week, God will use your own temptations. God doesn't tempt you. The Bible says God tempts no man, neither can he be tempted. But we are drawn away by our own sin when we're enticed by something that we see with our eyes or hear with our ears that's attractive. Okay? Um, God uses our own temptations to buffet us, to get part of that fire that he's forging us through. That's why James says, blessed is the man that endures it. See, temptation isn't a bad thing. Blessed is the man that endures it. For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life. And when it's tried, when that, when that thing was finished, he threw it at the, at the he, he, he tried it out. He wasn't trying it to destroy it. He was trying it to make sure that it was fit. Oh, it's ready now. You're good. And the Bible says that us being his children are like arrows from in his quiver. And we all have our season that he shoots us for, but you got to make that arrow first. Um, so God uses us, our own temptations, and he allows our own temptations to try us. And then he allows um, Satan to try us. And you might say, why? Well, he's tried Job. He tried Jesus. And he tried Joseph. When the woman came to him and was like, hey, you know, lay with me. My husband's not here. Lay with me. He's like, no, why would I sin against God and your husband? You know? And so, and then lastly, God, God tries you. He did it with Abraham. I'm trying to just a little bit. He did it with Abraham. When God told Abraham to give up your son, whom you love. So you, your temptations, are part of that fire, part of that, that, that tool that's being used to forge you. Satan is also, see Satan's just, Satan, Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But when you abide in God, he's just, he's just another servant making you better. And then God tries us. So, Today we're going to be talking about being perfected through sufferings. Now, last week we talked about um, what perfect meant when in regards to what we were talking about last week. And we were talking about how God is using the fire, which is the sufferings of this life, which I just mentioned. He uses it to form us into his image. And I gave the example of the glass blower who puts his, a lump of glass in the fire for a long period of time, even with 
the video we just watched. And it makes that glass durable enough to be used, to be, to be shaped. If you try to shape something without the fire, he's going to break it. That metal piece would have broken. But the fire allows it to be durable without it being broken. Because I'm healed. <laughs> I can't be healed. I can't be broken. You know what I mean? So, but in this context, what we're talking about today, you can turn to Hebrews 2, if you're not already there. In this context, what we're talking about today, we're going to be talking about another side of being made perfect. Hebrews 2, chapter, verse 9 and 10. Okay. So let's start with verse 8. Give us some context here. We've read the scripture, scripture several times. And it says here in verse, start with verse 8. But thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. He's talking about man. For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he's left nothing that is not put under him. So in the new world, and even now, you will be given dominion over everything. Every single thing that God has made, you are ruler of it. All creation. And it says, but now we don't see yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, meaning he became a man. Man is lower than angels in rank and from between heaven and earth. Earth is lower than heaven. We're earthly, they're, heaven, they're heavenly. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. So why was Jesus made? To suffer. To suffer death. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And this is the thing about grace, guys. I don't know what your definition of grace is. We've been taught a lot of things about grace. Like grace is just some kumbaya land that we're just going to just see flowers and, you know, snowfall and snowflakes. But in here it says that grace essentially empowered Jesus to endure the suffering of death. Grace empowers us. That's why he told Paul, my grace, it's enough for you to bear this. Everything that you're going to go through in life, the cup of suffering that you have to drink, and everybody has a cup of suffering, God's grace is sufficient for you. It is enough. You don't need nothing more. You don't need anything more. And then it says in verse 10, For it became him, but it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, or meaning all things are made by him. So it was fitting for the one that made everything, and it was fitting for the one by whom everything was made, and bringing many, that's you, sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation, or our salvation, perfect through suffering. And that word perfect means, in this context, complete. Now, okay, so Jesus, was made complete. The man part of him was already 100% God. But the human nature of Jesus had to be made complete. Now, one aspect of that, which we're not really going to talk about today, is, but it's really a good topic, is what I mentioned, that Jesus himself, even though he is the Son of God, even though he is the Messiah, even though he is King of kings and Lord of lords, he had to humble himself to go through the process to be that. You're already the father of many nations. 
but I'm going to take you through this journey. And this journey is going to make you fit to be that. Just like training on your job. I got hired. I'm a sales consultant for AT&T. That's my job description. As soon as I get hired, I tell everybody, yeah, I, 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 I do sales. But I didn't go through any training yet. You gotta go through the extensive training at AT&T. AT&T has some very extensive, extensive training. You gotta go through them. You gotta go fly out to some other place and get in a hotel and go through two weeks of training, then come back and then train again, and then go back more time. That's what they used to have. I don't know if they do that anymore. But think about the job that you had to go through. You're a salesman. You got some training to go through first because God wants you to reign perfectly. He wants you to reign like him. And that journey that he takes you through is perfecting you. I don't want to say it's qualifying you. You're already qualified. It just allows you to be, it allows you to operate in that position. You guys get what I'm saying? And Jesus had to go through that as a man. By God, he can do it. But man, God had never been a man until he put the fullness of himself in Christ. I'm this. I'm King, King, Lord of Lords. I'm this, I'm that, and that. But I'm going to subject myself to this so that I will be a fitting high priest, so that I, I'm going to temp, be tempted like they were so that I can comfort them in their temptations. I'm going to endure this life perfectly so that I can help comfort them. I will be, because then I can, uh, what's the word? I can, uh, come on, y'all help me. I can sympathize with them now because I've, I've been through it. You see? And this is why we don't see much success with presidents and world leaders because a lot of them are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. A lot of them, not all of them. So they can't really sympathize with you. I seen Hillary Clinton walk into the, this uh, this house of uh, of a, it wasn't a wealthy family. It was you know they were they looked you know, poor. And she walked in the house. She was just like, what? She can't sympathize with me. Or she can't sympathize with them. Because she hadn't been through what they went through. Do you always need to do what someone did in order to sympathize with them? No, you don't. I don't have to do drugs to know that I shouldn't do drugs. But when it comes to being able to sympathize with people, there's got to be a process you go through. Joseph, what did he have to go through? God showed him two dreams that showed him what he would become. Immediately he was thrown, betrayed by his brother. Immediately he was sold as a slave. So he's going to have people bow. He was showing people bowing to him. But now he finds himself as a slave in a foreign country. But then he gets exalted there. And then this woman comes and lies on him with sexual assault. And then he gets thrown in prison. You see that journey he had to go through? So... But in the context of what we're talking about there, here, we're talking about completing the work through suffering. Every one of you has a work that you are supposed to do. We don't hear it a lot, but you have something that you're supposed to do. Jesus says that he's going to meet us again one day. He's given every one of us some talents. You know the parable of the talents, okay? And he said he gave some one talent, he gave some five, he gave another one ten. And those talents is what they were, the, the, the work that they were called to fulfill. And so I gave you one talent, gave you five, gave you ten. And then when he comes back and said, what did you do with your talents? What did you do with the work that I gave you? And two of them multiplied their talent. They added to it, and then he gave them more. And then the one that had one talent, he said, well, what did you do with yours? He said, well, I hid it. I didn't do anything with it. And Jesus said, you wicked and slothful servant. 
See, then now it transforms from, oh, Jesus Christ died on sin, he finished the work, to, oh, wait, I have something to do. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus, commanding them to obey all that I have commanded you. Surely I am with you even into the end of the age. That's part of, that's, that's the work. You may not be on the street corner. You may not be leading a Bible study. You may not be a pastor. You may not be a prophet, but you're somebody. You're somebody. You have a duty. So the work that God has, that God has called you to complete, first you've got to understand what it is, but you're going to go through all of that. And then we're going to understand how it's completed. And it's completed through adversity. Everything in this life that God has called you to do. There will be, there'll be seasons of peace, absolutely. But adversity is a guarantee. Remember we talked about it last week. Uh, Mark, M Matthew 3. John says, I baptize with water. But there's one coming after me. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, which is the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of you. And with fire. Guaranteed. Jesus baptized all of his children with fire. But see, this is the thing about it is you have to submit to that. Jesus isn't making you submit to it. He'll bring the fire, but you can depart from the faith. You can leave and say, I don't want that. Or you can say, Lord, I know you're with me. Daniel on the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If the Lord doesn't deliver me, then he just doesn't. But I know he's with me. Got thrown in the fire, and they, won, they didn't even smell like fire. And then they said, Nebuchadnezzar said, wait, there's somebody else in there. Who's that in there? It seems like the son of man. And God was with them in there. And they said, come out of there. He brought him out. It's like, man, your God is real. You see, people see the glory of God in your sufferings. People see it, but God didn't keep them from that. He let them go through it. When I say keep, I mean he didn't prevent them from getting thrown in there. But in the fire, he kept them. But then there's some people. Let me show you this scripture before we move on. Then there's some people. Go to, go to uh, Hebrews 11. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Watch this. Verse 32. Hebrews 11, verse 32. And what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and Jephthah, and David also, and of Samuel, and all the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, meaning God showed it to them that they could have it, and he gave it to them. He said they subdued it. He, they wrought righteousness, or they brought forth righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. You see, they stopped it. It says, quenched the violence of fire. You see, we talked about that. Escaped the edge of the sword. You see, God can deliver you. And out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, meaning they turned the other armies away. And it says, women received their dead raised to life again. This is the part of Christianity that's talked about. And others were tortured. Oh, wait. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Why? Because they had a greater resurrection. Watch this. That they might obtain a better resurrection. Remember what? I don't know if I said this to you guys, but the level of suffering that you endure in this life it will amount to the level of resurrection that you experience. So if you suffer a lot, if God allows you to suffer a lot, you're blessed because the resurrection will be far greater. Just like Jesus said, if you love, she loves me more than you because she's been forgiven of much. He was talking, and it was like, why this lady hasn't stopped kissing your feet? He was like, because she's been forgiven of so much. So she loves me more. She shows love for me more. But you, you haven't even offered me anything to drink because you've been forgiven a little. So you love me little. He still loved me. God still accept their love. But because she loved, because she was forgiven a lot, she was a harlot. She recognized what she was forgiven and she 
her love for God was far greater than the love that Peter had. And we know Peter wrote a lot of the New Testament. The love was greater. So in the same way, the sufferings, the things that we endure, things that the church is coming into, your level of sufferings is going to determine the level of glory. But all, or the level of resurrection. But I will say this, there's no bitterness in the resurrection. Like everybody's going to be excited. Everybody's going to be happy. No one's going to be like, oh man, they, they got five crowns. But like no one's going to do that. There's no jealousy. There's no, you know, measuring of what someone else has or what I have. But if you suffer a lot, I'm not saying throw yourself in fire. Persecute me. I'm not saying do that. God, God will put you through what you need to put through. Get put through. He already has your life. He has your cup of suffering ready to be drunk. Whatever he allows you to drink, the glory is that much greater. And listen, it says, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. And remember, Paul is probably writing from prison right now. They were stoned, Stephen. They were sawn in two. When Jesus said that we will be hated, he's not, he's not making that up. He's not, he's not exaggerating. They were cut in half, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, being afflicted and tormented. This is what people were going through for God. Of whom the world was not worthy, but yet God says you're they're not worthy of you. Think of what Christ went through. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all and these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not have, should not be made perfect. So he's saying basically they had a promise. But they're not going to obtain the promise that they were waiting for, specific promise, which is being with God and him being with us. They didn't obtain it yet. God is waiting for all of us. You understand? The new heaven, the new earth. Okay. So, but do you see what these people went through? So some were delivered of the mouths of lions, still faced it. Some were delivered from war, I still faced war though. But then some did not even accept deliverance to obtain a better resurrection. Because they understood. I'd rather, they made a wage probably. I'd rather go through this, subject myself to this, than run from it. And it reminds me, and I didn't even think about this, but it reminds me of Elijah. We know that Elijah called down fire from heaven and stop the rain and cause a famine to be in the land for seven years. But yet when Jezebel threatened his life, he ran. I, I know, I'd probably run too. But I say that to show the difference between some of these people who would not have run. That there's fire, going to the fire. Running in the fire. Elijah, he's like, I'm dipping out. And he's still with the Lord. He didn't even die. He, God took him. He had mercy on him. He took him. He didn't see death. He just got translated. But I believe it's God's will, perfect will, <clears throat> for us not to run. The reason being is because the resurrection will follow him greater. Okay? So, Acts 14, 21 through 22. I'm going to go there. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to read this real quick so we can get into the work that we must complete. It tells us that, uh, and when they had preached the gospel to, to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls, which is what the disciples did, they confirmed the souls of the disciples, of the apostles, sorry, the apostles went and, and did this. And exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must 
through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. How do we enter into the kingdom of God? Through much. And he said it to everyone. He didn't just say it to, well, you're going to go through them. He said much for all of you. Okay, so. There's a work to complete. Let's go to John 17 real quick. John 17. I know we're moving around a lot. A lot of this I didn't. A lot of what I said just now was not planned. Um, John 17. Let's read this. Let's, uh, let's see if we can identify the work that we have to complete through suffering. Or identify Jesus' work. So John 17 verses 1 through 5. So these words Jesus spoke and lifted up his eyes to heaven. This is when he's praying to his father. And said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your son. Talking about himself. That thy son may glorify thee. As you have given him power over all flesh. That he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is life eternal. One of my favorite scriptures. That they might know thee. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What is eternal life? It's not just being with God. It's knowing him, having his knowledge, knowing who he is, having a real relationship with the living God. That's what Christianity is. It's nothing. It's not about being wealthy. It's not about being poor. It's about knowing God because people don't know God. And that's why people do what they do, because they haven't been in a relationship with God. Christianity is knowing God. And then it says, I have glorified thee on the earth. Meaning I've made your name known. I did what you asked me to do. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. This is what we want to be able to say in the end of our days. And now, O oh Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory that we had before the world was. So we know that Jesus is God. He was, he's the word made flesh. So he was with the Father in the form of his word. And then God put flesh on his word and put the fullness of himself in that body. That's the person of Jesus. Okay? So Jesus said, first thing I want to talk about, he said that the hour has come. And he's referring to the hour of suffering and death that he was appointed to endure and be delivered from by the resurrection. So that's when he's talking about the hour has come. Okay? And then and it says here, which we talked about it before, that the grace of God, uh, by the grace of God, he tasted death for every man. So he was empowered to go through this. And he knew when his hour had come. You know, and we want to be in such a relationship with God that when we know our hour comes, it's time for me to leave. I finished the work. See, when you know the work, you know when it's finished. Then you know the only thing left is transition through death however that death may be you know we all want to die peacefully i want to die peacefully i think i've been shown something different though i'm fine with it whatever but well, i don't want to say whatever but i'm fine with it so jesus says here when jesus said glorify thy son that thy son may glorify thee he was referring to his father raising him up on the third day after he endured the suffering of death so now let's identify the work, because the work must be completed through suffering. Okay, so according to John 17, 2, what is the work that the Father gave Jesus to do on earth prior to his death? Somebody, somebody get that for me. What's the work? John 17, 2. Uh, what you were in right now? It says, it says, after all, you've given him authority over all humanity. Mm -hmm. So he can give eternal life to those gave you know, gave himself to Christ. That's the work. That I that I might give eternal life to all of those that you've given me. Mm -hmm. So Jesus' work was to give eternal life. Okay? Is that not your job? As Christians? Can you give eternal life? Why not? He got baptized through the preaching. You can, you have the capability to give eternal life. 
Because you have the message that leads to eternal life. How do people have eternal life? Jesus is not here anymore. In the flesh, he works through us. So therefore, what he's been called to do, we also do. So not only are we identifying what Jesus has done, we're identifying what we're called to do. All right, so. And how did he complete that? Through sufferings. So that's one thing that Jesus, but let's go even deeper because it reveals our work. So he's called to give eternal life. What else is Jesus called to do? What else did Jesus do? Give me something else that Jesus did. Come on. What did Jesus do on earth? He healed. Boom. Okay. Give me something else. Miracles. No, he said miracles. Uh huh. I got him right in the death. What else? He restored. He restored. Anything else? Hmm? Hmm? Save people. Yeah, he cast it out demons. Okay. So, did he raise the dead? Yes. Okay. redeemed from the corruption that's in it. People are looking for it to be redeemed now. It's not going to happen until Jesus comes. And he's going to reign on this earth for 1,000 years. Okay? That's a whole nother topic. But he preached the kingdom of heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Um, he also came to establish the church. Which is us, isn't that a building? There's nothing wrong with being in a building, but people say I'm going to church when they say they're going to a building, but we're the church. So, Isaiah 61. Let's identify some more. This is what scripture. So we know that all these things are true. But let's let's get some more. even to contain it. The Bible says that. So what we know now is only in part. Now watch this. Here we go. Isaiah 61. This is what Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings. Preach good tidings to the meek. That's what Jesus did. What else did he call to do? He sent me to bind the brokenhearted. That's something else. To proclaim liberty to those that are captive. Tell them that the prison is open. And the opening of the prison to those that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Meaning this is a time that God is accepting people. There will be a time when God is no longer accepting people. The Antichrist, when he comes, when they receive the mark of the beast, the Bible says no man can be saved at that time. They will be cut off from salvation. But right now, for the last 2,000 years, it's the acceptable year of the Lord. And then it says, and, the, and proclaim the day of vengeance. So tell them also that Jesus is coming back with vengeance. And to comfort all that mourn. 
to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes. Zion is, represents the church. All of those that, God's people that mourn, give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, planting the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Okay, and there's more. There's more than that. But all of what I just mentioned, from all of this, to the good tidings, preaching the good tidings, to preaching, uh, you preaching that to the meek, to binding up the brokenhearted, to proclaiming liberty to the captives, opening the prisons, and all of those things, and the acceptable year of the Lord, and the coming of Jesus. That's the work. That's the work that Jesus did. Okay? Now, we already made it clear in Hebrews chapter 2 that all of this that was fulfilled and everything that we mentioned in Isaiah 61 was done was completed through Jesus did all of this for us through opposition. Jesus did all of this for us through tribulation. He did all of this for us through adversity, through temptations, through afflictions, all of it. Now, what were those sufferings? Isaiah 53. I'm going to read it. Here are the sufferings of the Lord. Hey, Daniel, you want to come right real quick? Yeah. Turn off. Keep stopping. You can just uh, put it up here. Um, so I'll tell you what's right. Okay. So we're going to identify the sufferings. Isaiah 53, starting with verse 3. You guys ready? All right. He is despised. Despised. And rejected. This is talking about Jesus. This is what he went through. He's despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows. A man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from them. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Wasn't Jesus made sin for us? Didn't he feel the temptations that we felt as humans? Did he not go through those things? Yet we did esteem him stricken. So he was esteemed stricken. He was esteemed as smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his... I think it's good. Because everything is basically repeat, repeat, repeating. Thank you. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before her shearers is dumb. Meaning he didn't speak. So he did not open his mouth. So as he was being brought to judgment, he was quiet. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. 
for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. He died as a sinner. And with the rich in his death he died, but he was also buried in a rich man's grave. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit, deceit in his mouth. I'm going to stop there. So, Jesus did all this good stuff. We all want to preach. We all want to establish the church. We all want to heal and do miracles and restore and cast out devils and raise the dead. But Jesus did it all through these things. Through the sufferings. He bore it. He went through it. He went through it. Despised. Let's break it down. He was regarded with contempt. You ever had someone despise you? A boss, a family member? Or you ever despised anyone? You regard them with the contempt. You look at them like they're worthless. But like they're vile. He was rejected, meaning he was forsaken. Now this is by the people that he made. Think about your children and how much they may upset us when they talk back. Well, these He's dealing with his own creation that killed him. So he was forsaken. He was made destitute. He had sorrow. Sorrow is pain of the soul. Anguish in the soul. Grief in the soul. Because he was seeing what his people was going through. He felt it. Yet no one esteemed him. Meaning they didn't help high him in hold him in high regard. They didn't even consider him like, oh, he's smitten of God. He's afflicted. He's going through this because of his own sins. He bore our griefs, meaning our sicknesses and disease, meaning he took them away. And even on the cross, he bore the sin and all the things that we deal with that come with sin, the weight of it. And along with bearing all of these things because of us, he also had to deal with his own temptations as a man. Yet he did not sin. And he finished the work through all of this. Now what does that say about you? What does that say about us? I'm going to show you. John 17. Let me show you. Let's start. We already read through five. Let's start with six. We're going to look for what that means for us. I have manifested or revealed your name to men. This is what Jesus, he's revealing what he's done. I have manifested your name to men, which you gave me. And remember, that's what eternal life is. The ones that you gave me out of the world, they are yours. They, I'm sorry, they, thine they were, meaning they were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known all things whatsoever you have given me come from you. Do you know that about Jesus? For I have given unto them the words which you gave me to speak, and they've received them, and have known surely that I've come out of you, and have believed that you did send me. This is what we, we should be, he should be able to say this about us. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, the ones that are not going to be saved. And God, only God knows that. And he says, I pray not for them, but for those which you have given me, for they are yours. And all that is yours is mine. And all that is mine is yours. And I am glorified in them. Meaning I'm seen in them. They do what I do and they glorify me. And now I am no more in the world. Meaning I'm going to leave this place. But they are in the world. But I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them through your own name, those whom you've given me. This is his prayer for us, that they may be one even as we are one, unified. 
while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name or in your power, in your authority. Those that you gave me I've kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, Judas, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have jo that, that my joy may be fulfilled in them. Because God wants us to have joy here, even in the midst of all of the things that are going on. The joy should be fulfilled in us. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And then he says, I pray that you don't take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one, Satan. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them means set them apart. Purify them through your truth. Your word is your truth. So God's purifying us through his word. If we abide in it. And it says, as, watch, this is the key verse. As you have sent me into the world, even so have I sent them. So this, right here, all these things that Jesus did, that's your work. You are to finish the work that he started. That is what ministry is. Ministry is picking up the plow where, it left, where God left off. That's why his disciples did exactly what they saw him do. You are to go and give eternal life. You are to go and heal. You are to do miracles. You are to bring restoration. You are to cast out devils. You are to raise the dead. You should fulfill the law. You should preach the gospel. You should preach the kingdom. You should help establish the church and perfect it and everything else that Isaiah 61 mentioned. But you do all of that through the sufferings. You will be despised and rejected. You will be a man or woman of sorrows. Because you've come out of the world and you see the state of the world and those that you love and it vexes you. This is why Peter, not Peter, this is why Lot was vexed with the filthy communication of the wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he cried out for deliverance because he wasn't of Sodom and Gomorrah. All the homosexuality that was going on, he was crying out. <clears throat> you will be a man or woman of sorrows if you're of God. If you love this life, then you'll never experience any of this because these are the sufferings of Christ and we're called to bear them. You will be acquainted with grief. You will be esteemed, stricken, as counted as worthless. You will, well, you may not be wounded for transgressions, but you'll go through some things. A lot of things. Everything that Jesus went through. Because you have to remember this. We're the church, but what are we also? The body of Jesus. Literally. So whatever his body bore, you carry. What did he endure? The cross. What did Jesus say? If any man seeks to follow after me, he must first deny, pick up his Deny, deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. In Romans I believe, chapter 8, it says if we want to be glorified, and this is also a form of glory right here, but also uh, having eternal life. If you want to be glorified with Christ, you must also share in this. If that's something that you're willing to do, I know we, we all say we're, we all, I believe everyone in here knows the Lord to our own measure. And we all can know him more. But is this, are you willing, first and foremost, to, to do this? Because see, what you're doing is 
this takes your life. And what I mean by that is you don't have any time for you. I'm not saying you can't have a job at the airport. I'm not saying you can't work in healthcare. But as you grow in, in the things of God, you know what happens? This starts to take up space. And then you realize it's getting in the way of some things that aren't really that important anymore. Now God will sustain you through it, whatever you give up. Jesus says, blessed is the one who gives up houses and all these different things for my sake. But they will have more houses in heaven. Blessed, he even talks about those that gives up Marriage. If you don't desire to be married and you want to do the will of God, you'll have more. Because when you're married, and there's nothing wrong with marriage, Paul makes it very clear, when you're married, you have to take care of earthly things as well as spiritual things. And God honors marriage. So you're not losing anything. But there are people who would rather not be married so they can, their whole lives can be constantly this. Paul said, I wish you guys were like me. Not married. That's what he's referring to. Because he experienced some things that married people won't experience. Or maybe harder to experience. But nevertheless, God honors marriage. And so I hope you guys get that. Because I'm married. I love my wife and my kids. But is this something that... Is this what you expect? Is this something that you're willing to bear? Because... Make a decision. Jesus says, count the cost. Don't start something that you're not willing to finish. I'm pretty much done. I'm, I'm reminded of Joseph and, every, and all of his toil that he had to go through in order to see the glory, see his dreams and the promises of God manifest. Are you willing to go through that? Because you can't pick what you go through. But you also, the glory is so much greater. The glory is not in vain. The suffering is not in vain. About David, God, as a kid, told him he would be a king. But he didn't tell him he had to deal with Saul, throwing knives at his head, trying to kill him. He had to run in the wilderness, had to abandon Israel. Because Saul was trying to take his life. We know about Jesus, but now where is Jesus through all of this? At the right hand of the Father, with all authority in his hands. And all will say, bow down to him and say, King of kings, Lord of lords. And all things given to him. In the same way it was given to Joseph after he went through all those things. He was second in command. There was no one greater than Joseph than Pharaoh. And Pharaoh gave Joseph all of his authority. And they gave him a signet ring that proved his authority. God wants to give you that signet ring. Have his authority. You have his name. You have his power to complete the work. But this is what the work is completed through. And everything else that's mentioned that we didn't write. And that's, that's the message, guys. So we must complete the work, but it's going to be through sufferings. All right. Amen. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions?